Today I'm going to be doing an acrylic painting demonstration of this otter. Hi, I'm Lisa, the artist behind La Cree Fine Art. The techniques that I'm going to be using in this painting will work for either oils or acrylics. With oils, you just want to let it dry in between some of these layers. I am working on a Fredericks Blue Label Ultra Smooth Canvas. I went with this one because I knew I needed a lot of tiny detail and blending acrylics, if you've worked in acrylics much, you know, they can be a bit of a challenge sometimes to blend smoothly. So you want to make sure if you're using this type of technique, if you're, you're really trying to get a ton of little detail, you want to go with a canvas that has a very, very fine tooth. It's very smooth. You're going to get smoother blending that way if you're not fighting against the tooth of your canvas. So in this case, the Fredericks Blue Label Ultra Smooth is a really, really good choice. And just for transparency, I am sponsored by Fredericks, but they were already the only canvas I used before I started working with them. So other than me now having to make an announcement about that, there's no difference. I would have used it anyway. If you are supporters over on Patreon, I turned this into a really long tutorial. I actually broke it up into two parts. I did the water in real time. Usually with Patreon, parts are sped up. With this one, the water was completely completely real time and that is a three hour long tutorial and then I have a second one just with the otter where parts are sped up a little bit along with a lot of real time clips as well. So that is five hours of footage for this one for those of you over on Patreon make sure to head over and check that out. If you are unfamiliar with Patreon for as little as four dollars a month you get access to all of my longer tutorials that are one to two hours long. I upload a new one every single week. You also get access to all of my older one to two hour long tutorials. There are a hundred over there so there's a lot of videos for four bucks a month. Now that I'm done with that self-promotion, let's move on to this tutorial. For this one, I started out by drawing everything out with a water-soluble graphite pencil. And the reason that I go with water-soluble versus a regular graphite is if I'm working with acrylics, sometimes those graphite lines will show through the paint, and I hate how that looks. If you use a water-soluble graphite, when you mix your water and your paint over it, they just blend out. Those lines go away completely, so you'll never be able to see graphite lines showing through the paint, which is a pretty big deal. So that is the way that I started with drawing this out. And now I'm just starting to block in my main chunks of paint. Now this I'm doing a little bit different than normal. I wanted to try painting this more how I paint with ink tents, where I'm blocking in my major shapes, my major lights and darks, without really worrying about blending or anything like that just yet. And I think that I do like my usual way of painting better. I think it was a little bit easier when I would just paint a base layer of, in this case, I would have painted a base medium teal and then put all my details on top, drawn everything out with a white charcoal pencil and then gone ahead and filled it in instead of fighting against the white of the canvas to start with. So I do think I'll do this a bit differently the next time that I'm trying to paint water. But I am very happy with what the end result was. The only real difference was that I feel like this took me a little bit longer than it would have if I would have just started with a base medium color so I wasn't up against the white. And anytime you're painting, there are going to be 20 different ways to get to the same end. You just have to figure out which way you like best. But there's no one right or wrong way to paint anything. So this color here, I've actually got a lot of green, this greenish gray color. And what I do, anytime I want a color that's going to have a grayish tone, I start by mixing black and white. So there's my gray tone. And then I slowly add in a little bit of the color that I want. So here, this is a green. I, it's actually my phalo blue and phalo green mixed together, but it has more green than the phalo blue there. For the brighter teal colors, I've got more of the phalo blue and phalo green. It's almost a 50-50 mixture. And that gives me that nice teal color. But on all of it, I've got a bit of black and white mixed in to give me that grayish tone so that it's not too bright. So again, just blocking everything in loosely. This Everything just looks like an absolute mess at this stage. That's okay. Don't ever be afraid. When you first start painting, your first few layers are probably going to look terrible. That's normal. That's okay. That's not something to be discouraged by. You're just going to keep painting and layering until it looks how you want it to. I'll have to move that my finished painting photo all over the place because... This guy is taking up all of the screen. Now, this photo comes from wildlifereferencephotos.com. So if you want to paint this exact otter, you need to go purchase it there so you've got the license. And then you can make prints and sell it and all of that. And you'll see if you go over there, even if you don't want to buy the photo, if you just want to see what my reference photo was, if you go over there and just do a search for otter, you'll see that this photo actually had a very grayish brown color for the water. I completely changed that for my artwork. So whenever you're using a reference photo, don't feel like you have to copy everything exactly. Make changes to make yours better. I've got a lot more green. I'm using a lot of hooker's green for the green green tones here. 
when I move into the teal, that's where I'm mixing my phthalo green and phthalo blue. And I'm okay with my brush strokes showing because I know I'm going to end up putting enough layers on top of it that it will smooth it out. But the little bits of brush strokes that you're seeing here will show through just a little bit, just enough to create a bit more depth through. It'll look like the water's a bit deeper in those areas. Again, nothing here has to be perfect on your beginning stages. You're just blocking things in. And from here on out, after this painting, anytime I'm working in oils or acrylics, I am now recording my palette as well. So that's really exciting. And the oil painting I have coming up in the next week or two, you'll get to see that. So that will hopefully be pretty helpful for everyone. It's something a lot of you have requested. So I finally got a setup to be able to do that for you. So once I get the majority of the white of the canvas covered, it gets a lot easier. That's where I can start making everything look better. And you really want to watch your reference photo when you're painting water. Watch which direction that water is going in. That really matters. That's how you're going to create that movement. It's really easy to think, okay, it's water. I'm just going to make these kind of little crisscross shapes with my brush, and now it looks like water splashing. Well, yeah, when you're a kid, that's how you get the look of water. But when you want to start making something look realistic, look at your reference photo. Look at how that water moves. That really makes a difference in creating a realistic-looking painting with water, assuming realism is your goal. So now I'm using the same greens that I used before, but I have more black and brown mixed in with them. So I'm ho using Hooker's Green, black, and I don't remember which brown, probably Van Dyke Brown. Don't ever feel like you need to try to use the exact same colors as me or as another artist. You can actually mix your own. You could paint this with purple water and have it look realistic. You, the thing that you want to focus on is your the values and contrast. Make sure your darks are dark enough, your lights are light enough. That's what's going to make things look more realistic. People seem to get this idea in their head that picking the exact right color, that that's what's going to make things look realistic. And if they only knew how to mix and pick the exact right color, their work would look so much better. That's really pretty minor in the big picture. You really want to focus on your contrast and your values. Though That will make all the difference in the world. I mean, even here, I'm not copying the color at all compared to what my reference photo was. This is so far off from what I saw on that photo. But it still looks very realistic. It's my contrast, my values, my highlights and shadows. Watch those. That will make a huge difference in your work no matter what you're painting. Now, the acrylic paints do dry pretty quick, so I've got to paint fast. If I want to blend something out, I need to paint in that area pretty quickly. So you see I'm focusing more on one small section of the painting, not the entire thing. It's easy when you're painting to want to paint the water, all of the water kind of together, where you've got brush strokes over on the left side of your canvas and then the right side of your canvas. Focus more in a case like this on one small area at a time. That way you have time to blend wet into wet where you need to. If you make a couple of brush strokes here and then a couple of brush strokes over on the, the left and then you're back to the right, that paint is drying too quick. You're not going to get any of the wet into wet blending. And what the wet into wet blending does, or your goal there, is to be able to blend while the paint, the previous color is still wet, you add another color, and those colors, because they're wet, they'll slightly blend together with a couple of brush strokes. If you're jumping around too much on the canvas, it's going to dry too quickly and you won't be able to do that. Now an alternative is to use an airbrush just to mist with water and the one that I recommend is just get a hobby kit. I'll put a link in the video description. You can just keep misting water. It gives you a fine fine mist without any big heavy water droplets like you would get with like a spray bottle. That would could ruin your painting or really mess up the layer anyway. Maybe not ruin it, but it won't look so good. Those heavy water droplets, when you go to blend with a mop brush, can pull the previous layers up, and it, it just makes a mess. But the airbrush, it, they're about $30, $35 for a hobby kit, and you can keep misting water to keep it wet for as long as you need to. Now, that is not something I used. I did here. I didn't use my airbrush at all on this one. I just painted fast and really focused more on one small area at a time. Another thing that you want to watch, if you're working in acrylics, you probably don't want to have a ceiling fan or an oscillating fan on in the room. That can cause the paint to dry faster. 
So just to, something to be aware of if you're trying to, to get the paint to dry a little bit slow, more slowly. Now, I do have people ask me regularly about using a slow drying medium. I don't recommend it. I don't like how it makes the paint feel. It's gunky. I just, I have never liked it. And I've never seen someone who painted in a style that I wanted my work to look like who used that. Everyone who I know of who paints with acrylics quickly or paints, it, I should, sorry, word, word that wrong, paints with acrylics well, either paints really, really fast or uses an airbrush to mist water to keep it wet. I definitely prefer those results. I've tried the slower drying mediums and was not happy with how the paint mixed and gunked up. So see how I'm just layering one color? Now this isn't a super high contrast between the two colors. They're actually the same colors I'm using for the dark bits and the light areas in the, this section that I'm working on. The only difference is how much white versus how much black is mixed in with those colors. So it's just a, a slightly lighter version than the darks that I had used. I'm not trying to mix a whole new batch with different greens and different blues. It's the same. It's just a matter of how much white or black is mixed in with that color. But it, it's fairly subtle, not too high contrast there. And this makes it seem like it's blended a little bit better than it really is, too, with using colors that are so similar to each other. Again, watching the reference photo. Now, I don't need every single brush stroke to be exactly like the reference photo in order to have the water look realistic. What I'm looking at is the movement of the water, which direction those brush strokes should go, how large, how long or thick each line is. That's the sort of thing that matters more. I'm not sitting there and counting, okay, I've got three lines going this way and then four lines diagonally and then it moves this way. I'm not counting anything. I'm not, it doesn't need to be exact. I just need to go for close so that I can create the movement, the, the look of the water. Now you can paint exact if that's something that you enjoy doing. There's nothing wrong with that. For me, I like to try to capture the look of something without spending two years working on it. And this water, you have to watch too. You're going to feel like, okay, I've made a few brush strokes. It looks like water. I did a good job. I'm just going to repeat that brush stroke again and again and again. Don't do that. That's not going to look natural. You're going to have a lot of variation. Look at how many areas where the water just completely changes direction. It's going diagonal and now it's going the, the other direction and it's all over the place. Watch the reference photo. And that's going to be the same when you're drawing animal fur. You'll do a couple of brush strokes and think, okay, it looks like fur. I'm just going to repeat this over and over and over again. I've got this. Don't do that. Really watch the reference photo. Which direction is the fur going? Same as the water. Which direction is the water going? Because it's going to move constantly. Now, I haven't come through with the highlights yet. Once I do that, that's going to make a huge, huge difference in making everything look more realistic, the brightest highlights. And those bright highlights, they look like I'm just using straight white. I'm not. They're actually just a much lighter version of the lightest greenish color that I have here. I've taken that same color and mixed that in with my titanium white. Not a ton. It is mostly white, but it's not straight white either. That's important. You want to keep your white, your brightest, brightest whites. Keep that for your brightest highlights, which you want to go fairly light on. I mean, don't, don't be very heavy handed with your white paint. Keep it for the brightest areas because if you put that everywhere, you can't go brighter from there. So I want to gradually move my way up when I start adding the white. So again, here, this looks like I'm using white, but I'm not. It's actually mixed with that teal green color. It's just a much lighter version of that color. And I will use some white for the highlights here, but not a lot. Most of this is going to be a more muted color with a little bit of that green mixed in. Here I'm really watching the direction of the water. These are much thinner lines than most everywhere else. And this brush that I'm using there, that is a synthetic hog haired liner brush. What I'm doing when I get to this bottom section where I want to smooth that out, I'm adding the paint with a liner brush and then I'm taking a stiffer, more, or stiffer, is that even a word? A stiff round brush and s smudging that out so that I get this very soft, more out of focus look as I move forward. 
And that's a technique. Uh, normally, to get that look, I would just use an airbrush. It's faster. But if you don't have an airbrush, this actually works very, very well. See, it's not straight white. Just smudging that out with that other brush. Now, you have to watch when you smudge out with that other brush, you only want to make a couple of brush strokes. Now, this part, all of the water on this painting is in real time over on Patreon. So if you're really interested in painting like this, you may want to check that out. But what I'm doing here is applying the wet paint and then smudging it. But you have to make sure not to apply wet paint over an area that's dry to the touch, but not completely dry. When you're doing this technique, you'll think that the area you just painted is almost instantly dry. It's not fully 100% dry. And if it's not, it's too easy for that paint when you put the next layer if that first layer isn't all the way dry, it'll lift an area up and create just an ugly, almost like a hole in the, the paint in that area. It looks terrible. Make sure when you're painting like this that that is completely, completely dry before you overlap something on top of it. I've switched to a small filbert here. Again, this is not white, it's just a little bit lighter than what my previous green was. Really watching the movement in the water and just softening it out so it's not too harsh. And what this is doing, this will pull the viewer up to the otter so I don't have too much detail in this big section in the bottom of the canvas. Up here I want the detail, this is up by the otter, but in the foreground, uh, or the bottom part of the canvas, that I want to keep really nice and soft. Onto this last section of the wave, same thing. This is just a lighter version of the colors I had previ previously used. Less black, more white, but it's still a grayish tone. I still have some black and white in it so that it's not too bright green. And really look here at all the different brush strokes. They're not the same. You want variation in there as you go through. I mean, right next to the otter is so different than the area I'm working on the top section of this wave. So now we can move on to the otter. So the first thing I'm going to do is just focus on his tail. It's easier if you focus on one small area than try to do the whole otter all at once. So I broke this down into four main sections, the tail, the body, the hands and neck, and then the head. And I'm not worried about the color being perfect at this point. What I'm mostly focusing on is making sure my lights are light enough, my darks are dark enough. I can come back and tint the color a little bit later on. Again, just watching my lights and my darks. And you're going to look at all of this, the water, the otter, everything. As you're painting, you want to look at it in terms of abstract shapes. If I look at that water and go, okay, I'm painting water, my brain tries to take over and says, oh, I know what water looks like. You've painted water enough times. I'm going to take over. You don't even need the reference photo. So you want to constantly look at it. Turn it upside down if you need to. If you can look at it as abstract shapes, your work is going to actually end up being much, much more realistic. And the tail's not completely finished. I'll come back and do a little bit of detailing later. But right now, I'm going to go ahead and move on to blocking in portions of the body. And when you look at it, up close like this. Most of the lines that I'm doing as I painted didn't make any sense. When I backed up and looked at it all together, it was like, okay, now I understand why I had to put a shadow here. All I did was look at the reference photo and try to copy where those shadows should go. It really, I mean, I honestly had no idea what I was doing when working on this small section. You just copy what you see in that reference photo. And I think that's something that so many artists don't want to hear that as being the answer. They want to know, how do you do this? How do you do that? And honestly, you look at your reference photo and you try to copy it. You, you try to recreate what you're seeing there and practice, of course. But l just copy what you see. It, don't overthink it. Look at it as little abstract shapes and copy what you're seeing there. Just watching the values, my lights and my darks. And I've pulled a little bit of that teal, the watercolor, into the otter, but it's not very deep green at that point. Very translucent. I want a slight reflection, but not too much. Getting some of the darker areas in. 
Now, once I get into his little hands, that was an area that you really want to look at as abstract shapes because it honestly made no sense to me at, when I was up close working at it. When I backed away, it made sense. But when I was this close, you know, really, really close to the canvas, it didn't make sense at all. It was just a mess of lights and darks. But when you back up, it really does all come together. Pulling some highlights through here. Now that I have the tail and the body in, it's easier for me to see what needs adjustments. I'm using a lot of transparent mixing white. It's not all titanium white. Titanium white is going to be very, very opaque. The transparent mixing white is much, much more translucent. And so if you're going to glaze a color, that's what you want to go with. For glazing, don't use your titanium white. That's too, it, it's not really a glaze at that point. You're just painting because it's too opaque. But the transparent mixing white, you can lighten colors a bit, but it still maintains that transparency. And so a lot of the body where I just wanted to lighten up the brown tones, that's what I used. You want to make sure that your darks are dark enough in order for your lights to be light enough. Sometimes you'll be struggling and not understand why your lights just aren't bright enough. Oftentimes that's just because what's next to it isn't dark enough yet. Watch your values. So here just blocking in and trying to copy the shapes that I see on that reference photo some little ovals. Now I really want to try to copy that area pretty closely. I don't want to just put random ovals all over the place because that's not going to look like little toes when you back away. They need to be in the right location. And I just keep building and layering. Some of these layers didn't really work out so well for me. I'm just going to keep layering until it looks how I want. A bad layer doesn't mean you ruined anything or that anything is went terribly wrong or is horrible or anything like that. Don't freak out about that. All a bad layer means is that you're not finished yet. Just really watching where my shadows go at that point. And see, even here, when you're zoomed in, that does not look like toes at all. That doesn't look like anything but a lump on his chest. Just keep layering until it comes together. And with the wet fur, the way that this is grouping on his arm and in his neck, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense either. So there's another area where you really want to watch that reference photo. You don't want to put highlights for the sake of highlights. You make sure that those highlights are in the right place because that determines the underlying bone and muscular structure. You, whenever you're painting a, any animal, you don't want to just randomly put highlights because you want highlights. Try to look at the photo, even if it's a kind of dark photo and you can't really see what you're, you're looking at, which often happens if you're painting pet portraits, really look where those highlights are. You can over accentuate those highlights, that's okay, but make sure they're in the right location. That is so important in making your work look realistic. I've got a few little white dots of the canvas showing through. That means I need more paint and water on my brush. And I do mix with water, but not so much that the paint is running. You don't want thin, thin water or watered down paint. Just enough that the paint flows smoothly for me. You can also use glazing medium instead of water if you prefer that. Normally, I reach for water over glazing medium, but there are times that I, I like the glazing medium better. So you'll want to play around with both to see which you prefer. There's some bright highlights now that go on after I've got most of the shadows in. It makes them look nice and shiny.
Watch too as you're painting. Don't do too much dabbing of the brush. I see people do that a lot where they're kind of hesitant and they're afraid to mess up. And so they're not making brush strokes, but they're almost stabbing the canvas with their br brush instead. That typically, that's kind of a toll painting look, more of a crafty type thing. It's fine for crafts, but when you're trying to make something look realistic, that's not a technique you're going to use that often. I'll use it for bushes and trees and such for my base layers, but when you're painting fur, you're rarely going to ever dab the paint onto the paint the canvas that's not going to give you a very realistic look now i'm going to come back and add more highlights and adjustments on everywhere that i've worked on the otter so far but i'm going to go ahead and skip up to his face now start blocking that in and just paying attention to where my lights and my darks go this is a smaller area so i'm using a flat brush here Usually you'll see me go with the filberts, the rounded tip, but here this is such a small area and I need a lot of different lines, so a flat brush is going to make it easier for me to create those clumps of fur on his face. The rounded brush, the filbert, it's going to blend almost too soft. Here I actually do want it to have a, a fairly stiff look. So starting by blocking in where the lights and the darks go, And that color on top, that tan color, you can see as that grayish brown, same thing, black and white mixed together, get my light gray color, and then I pull in a little bit of brown until I get to the, it to the color that I want. Using a liner brush to get the detailing in his eyes. This little ear there. And then I've got to create clumps and clusters of fur. Because that fur is all wet, it's going to group together. Now, if I was creating dry, soft fur, I'm going to overlap a lot more, blend a lot more. I'm not going to have as harsh with the details clumping the fur together. But this, I do want him to look wet. So watch how the, these bits of fur just clump and group. So it starts wide at the top of the clump of fur and then thins out to almost a V-shape, a slightly wavy V-shape for uh, the fur around his face. So they're starting to create the shadow under these clumps of fur. See, I'm, I'm taking another brush, it's a clean dry brush, and just smudging it a bit so that the line's not too harsh. And this is another area. I don't need it exact to the reference photo, just close. That's honestly good enough. And whenever you're using a liner brush, remember the harder you push, the thicker your line is going to be. If you want a really thin line, just barely let the tip of those bristles touch the paper. And I have a video showing you how to use a liner brush and how to load it properly. I'll put a, or have a card pop up so you can check that out. This is not straight white. Again, it's just the lighter tan. I've added more white to my tan color. I want to keep my brightest white for highlights. You're just going to keep adding more and more details until you get it where you want. Basically, if it doesn't look good yet, if you're looking at it and you're like, I didn't do a very good job, this isn't very good, then keep working on it. That means you're not finished yet. Let's see how that fur is clumping now where I've got the shadow underneath the browns. Now it looks like wet fur. And that's going to be the same no matter what type of wet fur, whether it be a dog or a tiger. You're going to clump it together like that to where it's almost like a V-shape, a kind of curved V-shape. Now 
And for the lighter brushes, I'm using a very, some are number ones, some are number twos, and some are number threes. And again, all of those are the synthetic hog hair. Now I can come on top with the brighter highlights and start focusing on that. And I'm going to start working around most of the otter, just adjusting my values and contrast at that point. A little bit of that teal color in there. Just so I get the reflection of water bouncing off his wet fur. And some brighter highlights now. This still isn't straight white. It, it still has a bit of that teal color mixed in, but it is a couple of shades lighter than the previous layers. Here, now that it does have more straight white mixed in on parts that I was using on the otter. Not much though, there though. And then I switched back when I come back to the water to mostly working with just a lighter version of the light, very, very, very light teal color. Painting in his little whiskers. And look how the whiskers overlap. That's really important. You don't want to just put straight lines everywhere. Look at how they overlap each other. That's going to give you a more natural look. A little bit more detailing on his nose. And towards the end of the painting, when I'm, I'm this far in, I usually will start taking a step away from the reference photo and just deciding what would make my piece look better. Do I want more brown, more red, kind of a reddish brown there? Do I need more highlights? You just need to decide what makes yours better. Using a reference photo isn't about copying every little teeny tiny thing exactly. You're taking that reference photo and just using it as reference and hopefully making your piece even better or, or making adjustments that you like better than what was on the reference. So in this case, I I changed the water, I changed a lot of my values and, and contrast in different areas. But I still need a reference photo so that I can see how, do, how the water moves, how the fur clumps together. I still need to be able to see those things, but that doesn't mean that every little line has to be exact either. As the artist, you've got to decide what changes you want to make in your own work. When you're painting, if you're ever looking at something and you think, oh my gosh, that's too hard. I'm never going to be able to paint something like that. Every single artist ever, I think, felt like that at some point or another. We all start out feeling that way. The more you paint, the more you practice, you're going to start noticing things that you never noticed before, whether it be how the water moves, how bright your highlights should be, how toned down, the way that the fur clumps together. You're going to notice more the more you paint. So watching videos, following along with tutorials is great, but if you don't go to the easel, if you don't go paint, you're never going to really improve, no matter how many videos you watch. So I just want to encourage you, make sure you head over to that easel. If you really want to improve your artwork, head over to the easel and choose projects to work on that are too hard for you, that are outside of what you consider your skill level to be. If you stick with stuff for beginners, stuff that you, seems easy enough for you, you will never progress past that. If you really want to get better with your work, copy tutorials or follow along with the tutorials or pick projects that are way outside of your skill level. You will learn so much faster that way than sticking to stuff that's intended for beginners. Again, I've got five hours of footage of this guy. All of the water was painted in real time and then parts of the otter were real time. Parts are sped up a little bit over on Patreon. So make sure to head over and check that out if you really want to see the way that I'm making these brush strokes a little bit better. If you have been following me over on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, you have seen some samples of my new video layout, which is going to include the palette for future videos. I am so excited about this. The next oil painting I have coming up in a couple of weeks, you will be able to see the palette as I paint. I've had a lot of requests for that, so hopefully that will help some of you out. Actually, the painting I'm working on for that one is this one. It's in progress. It's at a very ugly stage right now. 
it's got a ways to go. It's also wet, and I think I just got it on my hands again. Have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's around, has an orange arrow going to it. If you click on that, that'll help you to keep up to date with all of my new art videos every single week. And if you want to get some real-time clips of different things I'm working on, like this chickadee, I have a five-minute real-time clip of this one over on Facebook now. I just got this on my hands again. I've got to stop touching wet paint.